What's the word, y'all? The Boston Celtics take game number one in the Eastern Conference Finals, 133 to 128, an overtime game in a series that a lot of people have written off to be a four. I guess technically it could still be a four-game series. We only talk about game number one. But uh, the Indiana Pacers fault, and they fall hard. I know they have a bunch of injury luck to get to this point, but you cannot argue that this is a very talented basketball team. If Pete Skills is there from the beginning of the season, this is a 50-win team. I think in a regular season, they were 48 wins. So, like, this is a team that is very good, and they didn't back down today. Um, it probably shouldn't have went into overtime. Can you, I don't even know what the conversations would have been if the Celtics lost game number one. Specifically in that fashion that they were about to. Because the shot that Jason Tatum took down by three with, what, 20 seconds to go, the, the mid-range turnaround, mid-range jump shot, 12, 13 footer, that is one of the craziest shots to take when you're down by three in that situation. But... Rick Carlisle did it again. Now, this is not just a coaching thing. We could talk about all the things like the, the turnover that led to the, pay, the, the Celtics getting this ball back. But this is the second time in this playoff run where the Pacers were up by three and, and late in this game, and they opted not to foul. It happened again, and I don't remember which game it was. But it was the Chris Middleton game in the first round of the playoffs where they were up by three. They opted not to foul Chris Middleton. Chris Middleton hit that crazy shot, goes into overtime. Luckily, the Pacers pulled that one out, so nobody really cares about the fact that they didn't foul. But in this one, you didn't foul, and you lost. Some conversations, man. Some conversations. Um, yeah, I don't know what the conversation would have been if the Celtics lost this one because, again, they are such a heavy favorite. And if they lose this first game, I know a lot of people are going to parallel it to last year when they went against the Miami Heat, and the Miami Heat won, what, the first three of that series? Like, you didn't want to see that happen again. But they fall hard. They got into overtime. They didn't play with their food. They got out there, and they got some buckets. And it's, it's very cool. It's one of my favorite things. Um, about playoff basketball is watching a coach, I guess, experiment in real time or play lineups that they normally wouldn't play. Like early in this game, when the Pacers were coming back on that run, we saw Miles Turner, Obi Toppin, and Pascal Siakam on the court together. That that three has played like 25 total minutes together ever. And I don't know if the numbers will say from that. I think it was like a minute and a half. It wasn't even a long time. From that minute and a half that they played together, I don't know what the numbers will say. But it felt pretty good. Like, Obi Top gave them a huge, huge spark in that first half to help them stay in it. Um, and you know what's, what's so interesting about the, play, the Pacers so far? Like, you cannot deny their offensive talents. Like, in this one, um, they had 10 total free throws while the Celtics had 30. Again, I'm not here to talk about officiating, whatever, whatever. But when you see a team have 20 more free throws than their opponent, you just expect it to be not just a close win, but like a dominant win. But the Pacers' offense is so very good that I, I, technically they finished at 53% and 37% from three. But a lot of this game, they were just playing amazing basketball. And there were so many times where I'm watching the Celtics play, and uh, in this game specifically, and there were so many defensive coverages that were completely blown up. Where, like, one of my one of my least favorite things, well, I talk about my favorite things when, when coaches run random lineups, my least favorite things is teams that relinquish the switch so easily. I understand why they do it. I understand it. Don't I, Like, you don't have to explain that to me. But when the opposing best players, not even just the best players, Andrew Nimhart was going at, at, at Al Horford. I, I would want to see Derek White. I want to see Drew Holiday. I want to see Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, whoever it might be, fight through these screens instead of just relinquishing and letting Al Horford go one-on-one -on -one against a good player. And they were going at that in that fourth quarter. That, that run that they went on to take that lead was them going at Al Horford every single possession. It was Pete Skills versus, Pascal, uh, versus Al Horford. It was Nimhard versus Pascal. It was Tyrese Halliburton versus Pascal. It was all of that. And I think it happened again on the other side, but I honestly thought that the Pacers tried their very hardest to not allow this switch. The Celtics from the very first possession were hunting Tyrese Halliburton. And you knew it was going to happen. He's their least valuable defensive player for their team. So it makes sense. He's a thinner frame guy. And I think even his help defense tonight was, whoo, it was something. Um, but even they tried to fight to prevent it to, from happening. We're like, instead of just relinquishing the switch, sometimes they just do like a soft double to try to recover. And I thought the Celtics did a decent job of like picking it out um, overall. But I just hate to see they just relinquish it, especially when the person you're relinquishing it is getting killed. Like when the third, when the third basket end up dropping on Al Horford, I think we got to go back to the draw board and say, okay, maybe, maybe let's fight. It's not like Drew Holiday and, and Derek White aren't some of the best screen navigators in basketball. So let's see them fight. But they, they didn't. Um, I knew Joe Mazzullo was about to try to cook something up when he pulled up with no haircut. <laughs> it's Eastern Conference Finals. Everybody got fresh haircuts. Not, not Joe Mazzulla. He was locked in a basement looking at film the entire time and still... That almost didn't matter. Uh, Drew Holiday, amazing this game. They said it like three times in the broadcast. It's the most amount of points he scored this season, whether it be regular season or, um, or postseason. 
I know we talked about the shot that Jason Tatum took, but I think that the second half specifically was a really good Tatum half. I think he went into halftime with 10 points. He ended with, with 36. And then at overtime, he had a couple big baskets. He had that M1 on TJ McConnell. Um, a few times in this game, the opposing team was trying to foul, but did it successfully wrap them up. I think Nimhar had a foul like this on Jalen Brown as well. Um, and it just ended up being an M1. Um, but what a game. What a game. I'm excited about the rest of this. Um, if you're the Pacers, you, you're hurt, man. My boy Mason, one of my, my day one homies, he is, um, he is in our group chat. And his, he said, I'm hurt. I knew it. Um, we could have had them boys reeling. Yeah, I know. I know. Like, if you're a Pacers fan, this is a tough one to swallow. Because it's. I don't know how many chances you're going to get to go into the TD Garden and get a win now. For what it's worth, the Celtics haven't been this dominant uh, home team in the playoffs of the last couple seasons. And they did lose game number two in every single one of their series leading up to this one. But this is a one you really feel like you could have won. But you had the crucial turnover down the stretch. And then, obviously, not foul while up by three. Also, it's kind of weird to watch Tyrese Halliburton play, man. He ended up with 25 and 10, 8 for 18 from the field, 14 of those shots of threes. And if you look at his stats, let me see, uh, if you look at his stats, he is taking so many, 62% of his attempts right now are three-pointers. And that's just different than the regular season. And honestly, I mean, he's playing decent, very decent basketball. Here, here are the stats for y'all that are wondering. 62% of his, his attempts so far in the playoffs have been threes. When the regular season is about 48%. So it's a, an increase by a decent amount. And there are a few plays in this game. Specifically, the one I'm thinking about is the um, is the last play of the game. When they're trying to get something to happen, he is struggling to beat his defender off the bounce uh, at, a, at, at a rate that's just different than a regular season. Again, I don't know if that's the back. I don't know if that's the hammy. I mean, he's playing great basketball regardless. But I think it just makes it a little bit more tough for him. And for his teammates, if he can't really create the way he normally can. I mean, at the end of the day, this team is still good enough to put up 128 points. And they put up 1,000 points on the Knicks in those la that last game. So it's it hasn't hindered them too much. But when you break it down, it's like the last shot of the game. Potentially, this shot can win us the game. And he's struggling to create. That That's kind of the stuff I'm recognizing. I also thought, let's talk about this broadcast, bro. The audio mixing for ESPN was awful. It just really was. We're like... This, the Celtics came out guns blazing. and I heard every single peep it out. It was great there. But when the Celtics ended up uh, relinquishing that lead and the Pacers were on their run, it, it felt like it got very quiet. And I even made a tweet like, man, this game is really quiet. And people that are actually there responded to my tweet like, no, it's extremely loud. I don't know what you're talking about. And I recognized that it was the way they're mixing the goddamn game. I knew that it was loud eventually because I'm starting to realize that the whistle was blowing and, and the players don't even know what's going on. But on the broadcast, we heard the whistle very loud and clear. So the way they balanced things didn't make it feel like a playoff game until it was a really big shot. What I wanted for the 80, for, for the 48 minutes, I just want to hear what's going on, man. I just do. Because the crowd was electric. I mean, when Jalen Brown hit that shot, it was crazy. But it probably was like that for the majority of the game. But we at home didn't really get to experience it. It, it was so bad that even like um, uh, Breen and JJ and, and Doris couldn't hear the calls. But on the broadcast, we heard him loud and clear. Drew Holiday is doing his half halftime interview. He can't hear the person standing right next to him. But in the audio mixing, everything sounds perfectly fine. I just, I would want them to let us feel like it's a playoff game all the time and not just the crucial times of the game. That's all. I feel like there's a lot more I could really get to. Oh, last thing before we get out. I, I got so many comments. Like, Kenny hasn't talked about the Celtics so far in the playoffs. Brother, what did you want me to say? Like, y'all have been dominating every team. Like, yeah, you lost game number two in every series. But other than that, what you like, you want this to be a two minute video? The Celtics hit 26 threes tonight. Thank y'all so much for watching. No, it has to be something worth talking, something to talk about. And y'all taking care of y'all business. It's just that. But now we got this series. And I guess no matter what happens, I'm going to talk about it. Because we only got two series left, and I, or three series left, because we got the finals. I hate that. So we're going to talk about them all. 